So I have to say everything again? <laughs> Hi, I'm Valentin. I'm working at the System Software Group at the University in Erlangen. Uh, soon we'll relocate to the University of Hannover. So don't be surprised when the affiliation changes. Everything's fine. Um, I'm going to talk about our work about uh, testing configurations, about the problem how we can generate configurations by means of sampling and how to get it scalable to uh, continuous integration frameworks and to uh, developers' needs. So especially for the Linux kernel in this case. When we look at the Linux kernel and especially about the tests that are performed daily in the context of continuous integration, we see that on one side there's a lot of static analysis happening. For instance, with uh, Coxinel from Julia Laval's group. She was giving a session chair yesterday here. Or Sparse, which is a static analyzer directly written for the kernel, even by Linus Torvalds himself. And now more recently, uh, there is a new infrastructure for GCC plugins um, since Linux 4.8. Then certainly there's a lot of unit tests happening. Um, interface fuzzing becomes more and more important and prominent. And certainly a lot of build and boot tests, performance tests, and many more. And the important part here is that in nearly all cases, we need a configuration. Why do we need a configuration? Because we need to build software. So there is not only compile testing done, we really need to build software, certainly to make it executable. And in terms of software product lines or variability in general, it's desirable to test as many uh, variants, different variants as possible. So the key challenge we face is how we can find different configurations for testing. And this certainly is complex. Here we see uh, the different stages of the build system in Linux or how Linux in general is built. So we start with a config where, where we can select some configuration, right? We want the features and the configuration options that we select, which certainly impacts the build system. So we have conditional compilation by means of make, then the well-known if def hell and then there's also some variability on the compiler and the linker level um, because we can also alter the flags certainly in the uh, build system and the make files. But on not only the complexity, also the size is a problem when we have a look uh, at Linux. Um, now we are, I guess, even above 16,000 different configuration options. We have hundreds of thousands of ifdef blocks thousands of make files, including all conditional compilation rules and different architectures, which means we have slightly different variability models and we have certainly slightly different or tremendously different um, build systems or at least how the image is built in the end. And this is not only a problem that research and academia sees, it also made, made its way to industry. Here's a quote from Ingo Molner. He is a senior Linux kernel developer and he says, in fact, our kernel configuration user interface and workflow is still so bad that it's an effort to stay current, even with a standalone and working config, even for experienced kernel developers. So now I'd like to talk about the solutions from the Linux community or how the Linux community tackles the problem to find configurations for different testing purposes. And we mostly detected two. The first one is to use a predefined set of configurations. Those can either be hard-coded in the build system. So for instance, all yes, which sets all configuration options on yes, or most of them all no, which is the opposite. Or using random configs, for instance, um, which comes later. Uh, the problem here is that it requires a lot of domain-specific knowledge, right? Some developers may also maintain their own configurations they use to test their, their subsystem. And this implies high maintenance costs. The second uh, you know, way to deal with a problem is what I call the shotgun, which is using randomized configurations. So the idea and philosophy behind is to generate randomized configurations and just shoot around 
as long as we can uh, in the hope to finally hit something usable in the end. It certainly replaces brain and manpower by pure chance, but there is no guarantee at all that the code we are interested in will be compiled. This is something we see later on. Another problem is that there's no uniform distribution uh, over the configuration space that we have. This is a problem, uh, more a technical problem, because kconfigs or the configuration system in Linux has no SAT solver. So there's actually a predefined path and at every possible hop a coin is flipped like uh, to, to assign a certain value. So there's a high bias inside. Certainly both approaches are not systematic. And uh, as there is nothing systematic outside for the Linux community at the moment, it scales. And this is, this is bad, especially considering the fact that there are some big um, infrastructures for continuous integration outside. So Linux Zero Day Robot, for instance, has more than 36,000 builds per day. So I expect a lot of redundancy inside those tests. And this is not, uh, not systematic. The research community, we have heard about this today uh, quite a lot already, came up with sampling. So sampling in this context means we have some, let's say, variability tokens at input. This can be an if-diff log or a stream of if-diff logs. This can be some configuration options or features. And it generates configurations that systematically disable or enable those configurations. This can be combinatorial, for instance, with uh, pairwise sampling, as Mustafa presented before. It can be blockwise. Um, the important message is there is uh, algorithms and tool outside that can generate configurations. The problem when it comes to continuous integration and developer needs is, as always, scalability. There is basically two big classes of sampling in this context. There's local sampling, which means we analyze files. So we have analysis per file. So we look at each file separately. We generate configurations that enable those files in different configura configurations, uh, et cetera. So this is known to work. And there's lots of related and previous work showing the usefulness. Um, combinatorial algorithms have a problem uh, related to scalability in most cases when feature constraints come into hand. So um, we uh, this is the nature of combinatorial uh, algorithms, which become more and more expensive when we have a real feature model behind that we need to use in this case. Another problem is that those configurations naturally generate at least one configuration per file. So when the n becomes large enough, let's say in case of a Linux kernel around 30,000 files, we have 30,000 different configurations that we certainly cannot use for build testing because this is out of the limited budget that we have. Then there's also global analysis, which means we look at the variability, the entirety of variability at once. So this can be, we par do pairwise sampling on the feature model. Uh, we concatenate all files and apply sampling at this big blob. The problem is that either they explode because we have uh, exponential problems, sometimes uh, quadratic problems, um, or it generates too few uh, configurations, or if it does not explode, it takes too long. So the state of the art um, is not really practical for continuous integration systems mostly because it takes too long. So the problem we were, or we wanted to solve is how we can make um, this sampling global because we need to build software in order to test it and how to make it scalable at the same time. So again, global sampling is desirable because we have a global view of everything. We can test it at once, but it does not scale. And local sampling scales, but it generates too many configurations. So the idea we have was to apply local sampling because it scales and then just reduce the amount of configurations afterwards. So we need to somehow merge those configurations. And the idea behind was to abstract it as a graph problem. And merging configurations in this case means to find clicks. 
So we draw an edge between configurations that are compatible. And if we find a click, we have a subset of the graph where all configurations can be merged together. And the overall goal was, as I said, was to reduce the amount of configurations that we need for testing and to make it, um, by those means, uh, scalable beyond compile testing, right? We want to build software not only to compile with. So the workflow looks as, uh, as follows. We apply our local sampling of the source code. We build a graph. So here CCG means uh, configuration compatibility graph. We find clicks in this graph. We merge those clicks, which actually are configurations, to a smaller set of configurations, and then can use those configurations to test our different variants. The configuration compatibility graph, well, this was, from an engineering perspective, a first bottleneck. Right? We have to compare all configurations, and configurations are represented as text, as strings. This is quite expensive in terms of memory. So we needed to do a lot of, uh, a lot of optimizations, and we came up with a parallel bit algorithm to well, build the graph and also to compare the configurations. Details you can find in the paper. The basic idea was, um, as those configurations can only have three values, we can represent or we can pack 21 configuration options in one 64-bit word, which compresses uh, the memory footprint already, and then to apply some bit operations. Bit operations are very efficient and uh, very cheap for the CPU, so we really got that fast. Finding clicks, well, we don't only need to find a click. The aim was to find a maximum click. And this is not NP-hard. This is an NP-complete problem. And this is something we did not solve our own. We used existing tools. Um, here, kudos to um, Ryan Rossi and colleagues for the parallel maximum click library. It's really easy to use. It's on GitHub. It's a GPL license, so very nice to use, uh, at least for GPL licensed software. Um, and certainly, we cannot compute the optimum. So we decided to drive the heuristics that are already implemented, which uh, is nearest neighbor and k-core, basically. And we did some benchmarks on a graph which had roughly 60,000 nodes. And we found that when we use those approximations, so when we only approximate the solution, it's 18,000 times faster, uh, 18, yeah, 18,000 times faster, sorry, and the click is 7% smaller. So we said, okay, this is a nice trade-off because it actually um, terminates in a reasonable time, as we see later, and we don't lose so much compression in the end. We put everything in a tool. Um, you can find it on GitHub. There's also a nice logo my girlfriend made. I find it very nice. So all source code is available. Um, there is a rather verbose how-to, how you can use the tool, and all evaluation scripts we used uh, in the course of this paper, you can also find on, on GitHub. So there's, for instance, some compiler wrappers that, so that we don't need to compile everything, but just apply some parsing. Let's come to the uh, evaluation. We were interested in three main issues. First issue is which kinds of sampling strategies can we use? So as I said before, different sampling algorithms have different runtimes. Certainly some are combinatorial, which naturally take longer than non-combinatorial algorithms. So we wanted to figure out how big can the input be to use different sampling algorithms. Also because they have different fault detection capabilities and as we have heard before from uh, Mustafa, um, feature interactions should be covered as well. The second question is which compression rates can Troll achieve? So our overall goal was to reduce the amount of builds that we have to do for software. And so here we want to figure out how good we actually can get with our approach. The third question is, how useful are the merged configurations? So when we look at Linux, and we know we have 
we certainly know we have more than 30,000 configurations. We can be pretty sure that we can't compress them just to 10 or 20. We may have hundreds or even thousands of configurations in the end that we have merged. So we need to discriminate them and figure out which are best for uh, testing. In this course, we use two sampling uh, approaches. The first one is pairwise sampling. We have heard uh, a lot uh, in the talk before about it. So what we did is we looked at a file, we extracted um, referenced options, we built valid pairs and expanded them to a configuration. The second one is statement coverage. Statement coverage, what it actually does, it looks at the if diff blocks and it tries to enable each if diff block at least once. So the philosophy behind is that each line of source code has seen the compiler at least once. For or to compare the results, the merged configurations, in the end, we applied to or we use two metrics. The first metric is block coverage, which is basically counting the amount of if def blocks being enabled by a certain configuration. <coughs> and uh, the second metric is the amount of sparse warnings. As I told before, sparse is a static analyzer written for the kernel, which detects common errors and uh, coding issues in Linux. So here's a lot of data. Don't, don't be scared. We go through step by step. So here we see um, the data for the USB subsystem and an entire x86 kernel. What I forgot to say before is that those are the two subject systems that we investigated. We looked at a smaller subsystem, which is the USB subsystem in Linux, and an entire x86 kernel. When we look at the size here, it's around 700 versus 30,000 um, different source files, headers included in this case. So there is some difference in size. When we look at the sample configurations, it's no real surprise. Power sampling is something combinatorial, so it yields way more configurations than a uh, rather simple, stupid statement coverage algorithm, which just to enable, which just wants to enable if diff blocks, and at best all all at once. Same for the x86 kernel. What we see here is that the difference is even bigger. So using pairwise sampling yields more than 134,000 configurations, which means we have a we have a rather rather big graph in the end. The times is as written here from seconds to minutes to hours. We can see that statement coverage um, is way faster in both cases than pairwise sampling because pairwise sampling is more complex and it's a combinatorial algorithm. We even have a quadratic amount of subcalls because we need to validate each pair, which is another bottleneck here. Um, I consider the two and a half minutes for pairwise sampling in the USB subsystem still to be acceptable, right? You're a developer, that that's the time to grab a coffee or, or a tea or go to the toilet. Well, 15 minutes means more coffee or a long toilet, but the two hours of pairwise sampling an x86 kernel is not really acceptable. Uh, to get this really um, working in continuous integration context would mean some more optimizations in the framework where we can apply incremental sampling, um, but not at the current state. Looking at the compression rates, we are between 85% uh, and 90.6% for the USB subsystem, and 93 and 96.3% in the x86 kernel, which sounds nice. Well, 96% uh, sounds like a really nice compression rate, but we still have to look at how many configurations uh, we have in the end, and this is still around 5,000. So later, we will see how we can choose some of those configurations uh, in order to use them for build testing. What's worth mentioning is how long it took to merge. So in all cases, uh, our implementation trawl was reasonably fast, but for the 134,000 uh, configurations when we pairwise sampled the x86 kernel. So it took around 12 and a half hours, which is a really, really long time. And it's not something I recommend to do on, uh, on a normal workstation because it used more than 120 gigabytes. The problem here is that the click merging becomes really, really complex. The memory usage just explodes in this case. 
um, but this is in the nature of the algorithms. Time is short, I guess. So let's have a closer look at the USB subsystem. First, the size of the clicks to look a little bit deeper into the compression rates. As a reminder, USB subsystem had or has 700, around 700 initial files. We get when we statement, we use statement sampling, apply statement sampling around 780 configurations, 776 to be precise, and we can reduce them to uh, or merge them to 121 configurations. And what we can see here in the chart, notice that the x axis, the distance are not uh, equidistant here. I needed to compress it a little bit more. Um, what we can see is that 77 of those 121 clicks have a size of 1, which actually means we they could not be merged with any other configuration. Uh, we call those configurations uh, exotic configurations, and we had a closer look at it, and we blame that the SAT solver and the model slicing, which is an integral part of the approach, um, selects or decides in some cases, depending on the slice in this feature model, uh, some rather exotic combinations of configuration option and assignment, which in this case yields them to be uh, incompatible with other configurations. But what we can also see down on the right that there are a few configurations, in this case one configuration which covers already more than 50%. And this is something we compared here. So again, we are in the USB subsystem. We asked Greg Crow Hartman, who is USB maintainer in the Linux kernel, who said, who gave us one configuration that he uses for testing, uh, for doing local testing on his machines. And so we further compared it to 121 random configurations that we generated. As I said, that's somehow the state of the art in how the Linux community deals with it. And what we see here in terms of covered blocks, so again, we counted the amount of ISTIF blocks that are enabled by a certain configuration. We see that with the top two and top three configurations respectively, we already beat uh, the baseline. And we also see that rent config gives us no guarantee about the uh, if the source code that we're interested in uh, will actually be compiled. So this is no surprise. Uh, what, what is certainly is uh, a surprise is if we use enough randomly generated configurations, well, they, they certainly beat us. This is, um, uh, this is something that previous research uh, also found in this case and which also somehow counts for continuous integration systems assuming that they have those resources. In terms of sparse warnings, we instantly outperform um, the baseline and we continuously um, are better than using RAN configurations, again, despite in the case when we use all configurations. And we uh, did the same evaluation on an entire x86 kernel. There's no time in this talk to, to cover all the data, but please refer to, to the paper. You can find uh, all details there. And here we compare also against using random configurations and all yes config, which is a common way to, to test an entire kernel, assuming that the more options are enabled, the more bugs we will find, at least the most code might be enabled. So all results in a nutshell. On a nutshell, what we found is that combinatorial sampling should be preferred. This is nothing new uh, in the end. It has better fault detection capabilities than a non-combinatorial algorithm, in this case, statement sampling, because we can also somehow simulate or let features interact. So we get the interactions among features in this case, in a systematic way. However, combinatorial algorithms only work for rather smaller inputs, so using it on the USB subsystem, so on, on around 700, maybe 2,000 files, skill, uh, still yields acceptable results. But if we apply it on an entire x86 kernel, uh, it, it really takes too long. 
it goes, the sampling time increases from 15 minutes to around two hours. The merging time increases from three minutes to over 12 hours, which I uh, doom to be really uh, unacceptable. And especially the memory consumption just explodes, right? We have to find clicks. This is a big problem. So it, it does not even run on a normal workstation. We get by using our approach compression rates between 85 and 96 percent. Well, this this sounds nice. Just looking at at those relative numbers, still we have hundreds or thousands of configurations in the end, which still exceeds the limited resources for testing. But we have also shown that the top one to four configurations can be used. They are better than using just a predefined set of configurations. And they're certainly better, at least more systematic than using random configurations. Because we have no guarantee if any source code will be compiled that we're interested in. Furthermore, our approach scales or can scale depending on the algorithms we choose. The entire tool, tool chain, so if we apply it on the USB subsystem, which in this case also includes we extract a variability model, we uh, generate batch files to um, sample the source files, we sample our source files, and we merge those configurations, uh, took us 30 seconds in total. So this is something really fast for rather smaller inputs. When we apply it to the entire x86 kernel, we're at around 18 minutes. Still, we can get it faster if we um, implement an incremental infrastructure for it. So to conclude the talk, variability is a really nasty thing when it comes to systematic testing software. Not only the size, also the complexity of those build systems in particular are um, make it really hard, nearly, nearly impossible. Um, and this is something not only academia has seen, it also made certainly its way to the industry because those guys are writing the software in this case. Our solution was to apply sampling, apply local sampling on the source files of interest. We and thereby use all the qualities of those algorithms, most importantly fault detection capabilities and also um, the scalability. So then we have a big amount of configurations that we reduce by means of graph theory. So we abstract it as the problem of finding clicks in a in a graph. When we have a click, we merge it to a smaller set of configurations. We can use them and you can find everything in the tool. Again, this is on GitHub. Everything is GPL licensed. Uh, we are happy to receive any feedback. Feel free to use it and I'm happy to ask any questions, to answer any questions.